around the world do you have right now? I um, I might have lost track at this point. I want to say we're probably close to 30 million crowdsourced locations. That's people all over the world checking in at places and really just adding places from scratch. Like when we started, we had a, uh, a very limited data set, a couple thousand venues, and everyone else in the world has kind of filled in the blanks for us. How many users? Uh, we are just north of 15 million users now. And how many check-ins per day are they making? Seconds per day, I believe we're seeing uh, over four million on a regular basis. How many offers? How many offers? We've got, this is rapid fire, we've got um, 600,000 merchants that are using the platform at this point. Do you know how many servers you're using to serve this? <laughs> well, everything, just about everything we're doing is on, on EC2, and uh, we're getting to the point where it's getting really expensive, so um, we're starting to look into that as well. Okay, I, I know somebody who can help. Yeah, I, uh, so I hear. <laughs> How many API calls are being made? Uh, it, it depends on how you cut it up. I just texted Naveen from backstage, and I heard the latest number was about 170 million per day. Wow. So, yeah, it's, um, the thing is, it's growing like a weed. I mean, we were here last year in the middle of the blizzard, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I think we spoke three times on three different panels because a lot of people couldn't make it. Um, but no, it's just like the growth has been incredible. And a lot of the growth that we're seeing now, um, it's happening, uh, it's, it's, it's happening, well, it's happening in the U.S., but it's also happening internationally. So about 50% of our usages is outside of the U.S. at this point. We're seeing huge growth in Southeast Asia. Um, Europe is holding very strong, and we're seeing really um, great growth in Brazil right now. Brazil is kind of off the charts. Yeah. Tell me about the competitive landscape. We're almost, we're really at the end of the first chapter of location-based services. Gowalla just got bought by uh, Facebook and then took their service service down, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. We, what is the landscape now for competition, competition yeah, it, for Foursquare? It's funny, we always, I always think of like milestones as um, South by Southwest, that conference in, in Austin. So we launched in South by Southwest 2009, and you know, that's, where we, that's where a lot of these um, other check-in services came from. Then in 2010, um, you know, we met up with these guys again, and we're wondering, okay, who's gonna come out on top? That was like the big location showdown. And then for 2011, you know, we started pushing our agenda a little bit more aggressively just because we had more people, we had more talented engineers, a lot of things we could do. Um, and we started pivoting away from you know, just being the check-in service when we launched our Explore functionality, which is the recommendation engine that's built off of all the check-ins that everyone's giving us. So the competitive landscape's pretty wide. You know, like, I, um, I think that we've grown um, big enough that I'm not stressed about a lot of the smaller competitors. Um, but we're, you know, we still have our eyes on like what Facebook's doing, what Google's doing, like what Twitter's doing with location. Um, you know, there's always uh, Yelp to look at as well. So there's a lot of people in the space um, it, because the space is pretty broad. It's like we're doing check-ins, we're doing deals, we're doing recommendations, we're trying to push people in interesting directions, like motivation for life. And so there's a lot of interesting areas there. Yeah. And, and since we were here last year, you've added a, a few new features. Tell me about those and, and what you've learned in the past year from doing the new features. Yeah, um, since it's funny to think like, oh, all that's happened in a year, right? So we were here last December, and I, I, I don't know if we talked about it at the point, but that's when we were working on the Explore recommendation engine. And this is what we announced at South by Southwest in, in March, and it's the thing that I'm really most proud of, because you know, I think we went through about two years of Foursquare where people thought that they were checking in for mayorships and points and badges, and I'm sure some of you guys have, have accomplished some of those things. But I think one of the things that we did when we launched Explore is kind of like, um, you know, Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid, right? So he's like teaching Daniel to kind of um, paint the fence, and he hates painting the fence, and all of a sudden he ends up learning karate. Well, I feel like we kind of did that with Explore. Like everyone was giving us all these check-ins, and then we kind of launched this feature. It's like the check-ins weren't just for the badges. Like every time you tell us that you like to go to the sushi place, we get better about recommending you another place to go to. Every time you tell us that, hey, you're really good, uh, or you, you know a lot about this area of Paris or this area of New York, we know that you're really familiar with that neighborhood, and we can suggest other things that you may not know about. Or we know like when you're in areas that you're not so familiar about, we can start offering things to help you out a little bit more. So I'm really excited about that agenda that we're pushing. I think the biggest thing that we've done recently is we launched this feature called Radar, which is you know, our way of saying it's like that Explore recommendation engine, but it's a version of that that you don't have to ask questions to. Like Explore, if I want to take my phone out of my pocket and search for you know, coffee shop near the web, um, it's going to give me a bunch of great recommendations. It's going to give me recommendations for art galleries and pizza places, but I have to ask Foursquare that question to get that result. And what we're trying to do with, with uh, the radar feature is know about all the things that you like to do, and then as you start walking around you know, familiar neighborhoods or foreign cities, we can buzz your phone and tell you about the things that you're supposed to pay attention to. So it's this idea, like, you know, we've always talked about 
Foursquare is this engine. It's like technology that facilitates serendipity. And how do you like how do you manifest that on the phone? And we've been trying to do it by making your you know making your device buzz, making your phone buzz to alert you about things that you normally wouldn't know about. Yeah. What's happening in the platform? Because I'm seeing uh, Foursquare data used in Instagram and Path and all all sorts of different apps. Yeah. Sonar and Banjo and probably how many apps are using Foursquare? Gosh, I don't even know the, the the number off the top of my head. But I think the thing that's really interesting is that a lot of developers, like I mean, everyone looks at Foursquare. It's like, oh, it's the service. It's it's recommendations. It's check-ins. It's game mechanics. And you know, of course, we've got the whole platform team that's powering a lot of the stuff, and all of our stuff is built on our own API. Um, but we've got like every all these other developers are deciding that our location API is the best one that's out there. And because it's crowdsourced, it's up to date. There's lots of user generated content in there. When a place closes, a super user in Paris will shut it down. When a new place opens in New York, someone will go and add it. And then it comes with all this social context as well, which is like all you have to do is ask us for you know a given. Um, you know, a, a given keyword and a given user ID, and then we can start returning you know targeted results instantly, right? Which is something that you don't get with some of the other location APIs. So we've been really satisfied to see how quickly that stuff's been adopting, and, and uh, just the great feedback that we're getting from, as you're saying, like Instagram and Path and Oink as well. Yeah. What kinds of signals are you hoping to get from those other ap applications to help your machine language? Our machine learning bring back more interesting data to your users. Yeah, it's interesting because like I think a lot of folks are pulling off our API, and we need to start finding ways for them to push back in, right? So one of the things like I'd love to see with an Instagram is you know people, someone will take a photo of a milkshake, and I'm like I want to eat that milkshake, I want that, and it's tagged with the location, which comes from the Foursquare API, but I want to say this milkshake remind me when I'm within a mile of this milkshake so I can get it, and that means the Instagram has to send us something. Right? I think the same would apply to Path or Oink or really any of these other services. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to play around with that um, with this button that we launched called um, Save to Foursquare. I don't know if you guys saw this. We announced it uh, about a week ago. And now, just like, you know, if you read an article in the New York Times, like there's a, you know, a like button and there's a tweet button. And now for all, of the, for all the New York Times articles that are about locations or about specific places, there's a save button. So like whenever you're reading something on your laptop, about, hey, this is in Munich, and I know I'm gonna be in Munich three weeks from now, so let me save this. It goes right into my Foursquare account, and then when I get off the plane, you know, Foursquare can remind me about that thing that I found a couple months ago. And this idea of like bridging the, like, the online world and all the stuff that we do online with the way that we walk around the physical world um, and like in the real world, like that's a really big idea, and, I, and we seem to be pushing it really aggressively. How are people changing because of your service? A lot of people had this initial reaction to Foursquare. Why would you do that? Why would you check in? Why would you tell people where you are? Yeah. But we're changing our behavior. My brother now is on Foursquare, right? Excellent. And I never expected that he would be on it for years. But we're changing. How are we changing? Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, uh, uh, successful services change user behaviors. Like, Facebook's done this, Twitter's done this. Like, how, how foreign was it two years ago to tweet that, hey, I'm gonna go exercise, I wanna join me? Like, that just, it just wasn't something that people thought about, now they think about it all the time. Um, you know, I think Foursquare has conditioned a lot of people that like, hey, when you go to a, a new place, if you wanna share that place, a great way to do it is through Foursquare. We're actually seeing a lot of users that check into places and they don't actually share the with, they don't share it with Twitter, they don't share it with Facebook. They might not even share it with their friends on Foursquare, they just keep it for themselves because they want Foursquare to know about that so the recommendation engine gets a little bit bigger. Um, one of the, the most interesting things I think we're seeing is the percentage of people that, um, that are using the app but aren't checking it at all, right? And we're seeing this number increase every month. And at first it's like, man, what, are we doing something wrong? Are we doing something right? And I think it's like analogous to the way that like Twitter paid attention to, um, hey, is it, what's more important? Is it the number of people tweeting or the number of people consuming those tweets? And I think what we're starting to do now, now that we have, like, we have well over a billion check-ins um, you know, in our big data machine at Foursquare, that all of those check-ins are becoming very good at helping even new users figure out what they should do like in their hometown or in a new city. So it turns into like, hey, I don't need to check in all the time. I can still kind of draft off everyone else's check-ins and benefit from a lot of the tips and from of the recommendations. Yeah. What, what web people don't see because of this is the hard work of building a company. Tell me a little bit about what kind of company you're trying to build and, and what kind of values you're trying to build to bring to that 
And would you ever sell to a, a bigger company again? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I'll tell you, the, the hardest part of this whole exercise is um, is building the company. And I don't know if there's any entrepreneurs here or people that are going through this right now. There's quite a few. But yeah, it's um, like every time we add like 10 or 15 people, the company breaks. And I think it's common of, of all companies that go through this. Like from five to 10 people we broke, from 10 to 20 we broke. And it's a matter of like just making sure that you know, there's, you know, there's enough product people matched up with enough engineers, there's enough designers matched up with enough product people. And when we don't get those ratios out, or when we don't get the ratios even, you run into bottlenecks, and that's what keeps breaking the company. And it's also like, we're almost uh, 100 people now. Like we have, we have um, an, you know, our, our headquarters in New York, we've got almost 20 people in San Francisco, we've got Omid, if you're here, our London uh, and Europe rep representative, uh, first time we've hired an employee in Europe, which is great. Um, and so, you know, keeping all those offices in check is a, it's a difficult thing to do. Do you talk about profitability or, you know, is this going to be a question we're going to have for a few years? Are you ever going to make money, enough money to be yeah. profitable and, and not have to take another round of funding? The, the profitability word doesn't come up so often in the office, but monetization does. And we think a lot about how do we take the tools that we've built, uh, the tools that, you know, that users are using, that people in this room are using on a regular basis, as well as like the merchants are using. Um, and, and how are we going to put those two things together uh, to make Foursquare a, a valuable long-term business? Um, you know, the amazing thing that we're seeing is that we don't, we don't have a sales force. We still have 600,000 merchants that are using the platform. It's all spread through word of mouth. Like you take, you know, I don't know if anyone here has claimed a business on Foursquare, but if you, you know, if you, uh, if you claim a business, you get access to the stats page, right? And if you show that stats page to a taco truck or a coffee shop, like they've never seen data like that. It's like, hey, here are all the customers that came in and checked in. Here's how influential they are. Like, hey, do you want to hit them up on Twitter or Facebook? If you want to, send them a message and tell them how great they are and tell them to come back and give them a free cupcake. Um, so there's, like, that's just the beginning of it. Like, we think of all the things that we're doing with our Explore recommendation engine right now. Like, Explore is great at telling me what restaurants to go to in Paris, but we can actually go to an individual, par uh, an individual restaurant or a business owner and say, based on all of our check-in data, these are going to be your best customers. And that's, like, that's crazy. No one's done that stuff before. And we're in a really good position to capitalize on it. What's, what's going to be the theme for the next year for you? Uh, what are you working with uh, your machine learning to try to figure out a new pattern about location? Yeah, so we're, we're, um, we're growing out this machine learning and, and big data team because it's a big part of what we're doing as a company. Um, you know, I think it's funny, like the, the two, it seems like it's been forever since we launched these things, but Explorer came just in March and the radar stuff just came in uh, in October. And I think those are the two big directions that we're going, right? So everyone still thinks of Foursquare as this, as this check-in service. Like in the U.S., like you see TV ads for you know, Verizon and AT&T and they kind of like mention, hey, you can check in and, and be mayor or something, which is great because it's, it's free publicity for Foursquare, but it doesn't really get to the essence of what we're doing. And I think what we're starting to get to is the point that like the app is really, really good at telling you the things that you should be doing for recognizing when you're in an unfamiliar neighborhood and suggesting things that you might be interested in. And this is like a problem or like, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem, it's like an opportunity, it's like it's stuff that we've been interested since grad school, since dodgeball. And like the reason we started Foursquare was to get another shot at trying to crack some of these questions. And like we're getting, we're getting pretty good at it. And so I think by the, um, what is it, December now? Like if we're on the same stage next year, like I think we'll be, um, I think the stuff that we're doing now is like blowing our minds internally will be in use by the rest of the people here. What are your favorite apps that use Foursquare? I, I love food spotting, for instance. It's yeah. really useful here in fr France because uh, a lot of the menus are only in French. So you pull out food spotting and just look at pictures and go, I want this. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that's awesome. Um, I think my, my two favorites, and I've given this answer before because they're still my favorites, um, is Foursquare and seven years ago, which is a service you sign up to and it just sends you an email and it's like, these are your check-ins from a year ago. And it doesn't sound super sexy, but when you get that email every morning, it's like, oh, guess what? You were at Disneyland last year and you checked in with all these rides. Oh, you were at Thanksgiving and here's the picture that you took of the, you know, the townie bar in your hometown. Like that stuff is, it's, it's kind of cool to get a reminder of that. Um, someone else built an app called um, uh, Don't Eat At, which is, um, it's a combination of the, um, you know, New York City opened up their, um, the, like the health rating data for all the restaurants in New York. 
And so when you check into the place, they'll send you a text message immediately that says, you should not eat here because like the place only scored a C out of you know on an A to F scale. So like don't eat here, it's dangerous. Or this place is fantastic, you enjoy your meal. So you know we're starting to see people <clears throat> using not just like the Foursquare data set, but like mashing it up with all these other interesting place and location data sets, and then kind of piggybacking off the check-in. The check-in is something that people do when they go to a place, and then a lot of developers use that as a trigger to say, hey, send this user something interesting that's gonna make their, you know, their next 15 or 20 minutes a little bit more interesting. Well, thank you so much, we're out of time. It's been a really interesting conversation. I'm looking forward to seeing you next year. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. It's great to have you back, Dennis. Thanks. Thanks. You're becoming a regular here. Yeah, I'll see you next year. Right? Yeah. I hope so. I'll see you tonight as well. <laughs> Congrats I to you, Loie. I, I remember when this was 200 people at the first Low Web. Yeah, you were, in, you, are here in you are here in 2003, right? Yeah, that's um, thanks to you guys. Yeah. It's because you're coming. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> right, and thank thanks you. to you guys. Thank you. Uh, Kevin